Okay. So welcome back to part two of Shaping the Future 2022. Uh, the next session is about learning through diverse identities. And I want to invite to chair Betsy Corcoran. Betsy was the founder of and a CEO of EdSurge, one of the most important edtech publications in the world. She is a strategist, writer, and entrepreneur. Betsy, please. Thank you. Thank you. Shalom. Let's try that again. Shalom. We're going to try that one more time. We call this call and response in the United States. I say something, you say something back. Shalom. Shalom. Better. Thank you. My name is Betsy Corcoran. Uh, as uh, we said, I started EdSurge. It's a news education resource on education technology, uh, covering many, many types of education technology and trying to amplify the voice of teachers around the world. This session is about identity. We heard in earlier sessions that there's nothing more crucial than starting with understanding the self, that it's hard to learn unless you're starting with understanding the self. But in a digital world, self could take on a brand new meaning. And that's a lot of what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to start with a small experiment. This is a real experiment with all of you. And so I hope you'll cooperate. You will have only two minutes to do this experiment. If you're standing in the back, please come in, take part of the experiment. Here's the experiment. Look around and find one person, ideally someone you don't know or don't know very well, sitting near you, OK? Find one person. Do you see someone that you don't know very well? Okay, now take a moment to look at them. Take a moment to think about yourself, and I want you to share one thing about yourself with this other person that you wouldn't read on LinkedIn or maybe not even Facebook. Okay, ready? You will have a minute and a half to do this. So again, for the people who are just walking in, this is an experiment. We are taking one minute to tell someone sitting next to us something about ourselves. Ready, set, go. People in the back, come in. We're doing a little experiment. Someone will tell you what it's about. Find a seat. You have 30 seconds. Again, you're telling someone next to you one thing about yourself and listening to one thing about themselves. 30 seconds left. Excellent. Stop. OK, everybody. As we say in America, da, 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 da. You guys know this prompt? This is what every school teacher in America does to get the class to settle down. Da, 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 da. 
You guys got to work on the call and response thing. Okay, so thank you very much for engaging in my little experiment. The question that I have for you is, how well do you know the person that you just met, the person that you're talking to? What do we know about ourselves and what do we share about that identity in a broader world? That's what we're gonna talk about today. And I suggest to you that our speakers are going to rock your world. We talk about the Copernican revolution in science, the transformation of thinking about the world or the universe is focused on the Earth to thinking about a different model where there are stars and our planet is simply one planet that revolves around another star. What if identity was like that? What if instead of one central identity, there are multiple identities? What does that mean? What does that mean for education? What does it mean when we have educators and Talia and other people saying that learning has to start with understanding the self and then learning our local environment and learning outward, but if there are multiple identities, what does that mean for learning and for the world that we're creating in the digital world? This is the subject of our conversation today. There will be some time for questions. I will encourage you to look at Slido and throw a couple questions on there. Otherwise, I get to ask all the questions. All right, we're gonna get started. I would like to invite my panelists. We have two phenomenal speakers and a very thoughtful panelist who are gonna be joining us on stage. Please come up and join me here. Our first speaker, thank you, yes, thank you. Our first speaker is going to be Dr. Lor Zamansen. He's a writer, a new media artist, a curator, a researcher, uh, and a professor at Tel Aviv University. And his work is focusing on digital culture, online behavior. He's done plays, he's done artwork, and he's going to challenge our thinking about how we are creating identity and what are some of the other factors that shape our identity, whether we want them to or not. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I want you to focus on the title of my talk for a second. It's called Representing Ourselves in a Hybrid World. I'm actually not so sure about this title anymore in the sense that I'm going to argue sort of the contrary, that who's doing the representing is not so much ourselves anymore. In fact, in many ways, big technology companies are the ones who decide for us how our identities are going to look offline, and sorry, online, but in a world that gets more hybrid, that will also probably involve or affect our offline experiences. And I'll start with this slide that Basically, Mark Zuckerberg has sent to me, not personally, of course, like two years ago. I don't know if you guys have been using this. So Facebook have released this emojis about two years ago and suggested, how can I represent myself in a more cute or amusing way? And now you can decide if it looks like me or doesn't look like me. And I was fascinated by this phenomenon because I've noticed that people tend to just create another version of themselves. We are so used to the fact that we need to be, in my case, Lior Zalmanson online, as we are offline, that we are one and the same. The idea is you need to portray yourself as accurately, supposedly, as possible, or sometimes make, I don't know, exaggerations, but still be yourself. And this is very different than the internet I grew up in. I'm a digital native born in the early 80s, and this used to be my internet. I don't know, how, how many of you remember this or have used this? Okay, we've seen some hands. So this is called MIRC or Merck. 
And the idea is this is a fully textual chat in which we create avatars, all time avatars. We represent ourselves well as whatever we want to be. And it was a very interesting age of exploration. It had a lot of downsides. We used to masquerade all the time and invent identities, a lot of the time leading people on. But in some ways, it was also an age of exploring one's identity, of expressing herself in, you could argue, probably a more authentic way. And if you remember this piece from The New Yorker, the idea that everyone could be anything online. So in the internet, nobody knows you're a dog because nobody knows who's behind, beyond, sorry, behind the uh, internet uh, identity. And I think we are not aware enough to how the internet has constantly played with our notion of identity and how we represent ourselves to others. So originally, of course, the internet or all time internet was called ARPANET at the time was a combination of scientific and, um, and security based institutes in the US. Back at the time, it was a small community. Everybody sort of knew each other. So, the, so they all knew who they're working with. It was only then in the 80s and of course in the early internet that we began to project over the internet our ideas of a fantastical world where we can explore identity, where we can be anyone who we want to be. Cyber, we now know the, world, the word cyber as cybersecurity. But back at the time, if you remember, cyberspace was this place where you can explore, was the entire internet. And we could be anyone who we wanted to be. But that changed. And why did it change? Why in the end of the 90s, we began not looking at the internet as a fantastical world to explore and started looking at it as a place where we need to be ourselves? Well, two things happened. Economically, there was the dot-com crash. A lot of startups back in the 90s, they did not have a working business model. They didn't know how to basically sustain themselves. And they weren't sure where the money is going to come from. So they needed to think about new ideas of gathering income. So this is number one, and I'll explain how they went about it in a, in a second. But first, let me explain number two. 9-11 happened 20 something years ago. And after 9-11, the US Congress has passed a bill in like crazy speed called the Patriot Act. And Patriot Act started demanding that people could not hide behind anonymity online. People need to be who they are and be accountable for their actions. Again, because back then they were afraid of terrorist action being conducted via the internet. The business model that have won and shaped the internet since that day was what is being called or called still ad networks. So you probably noticed this, that when you Google something, when you use something over Facebook, you, you end up seeing it everywhere in any website that you use. It's not just on Google anymore because all of these websites are connected and surveying what you do online and then giving you, distributing you the ads. So in reality, the internet these days, especially big platform internet, works on this idea that you need to give much more information about your real self because we want to sell you products. So people will, will then encourage to tell more and more things about who they are in reality. And from 2006, we call this phenomenon Web 2.0. The idea that the internet is a place to share. The idea that the internet is a place to tell something about yourself and gain some idea of social capital. It was a place suddenly where you were demanded to use your real identity and most of it was because of business interests. Those interests aligned with our own interests because we have some social capital to gain. We also want to be famous and influencer perhaps we want to gain more access to events like this one. We want to gain some reputation and momentum. But in reality, this demanded us to stop looking at the internet as a place for identity exploration and start developing identity services. 
So when Google Plus, the not so successful product by Google started, they said, we are not a social network. We are an identity service. And people were banned when they've used an identity that looks not real, that looked fake. Mark Zuckerberg at the time said, having two identities for yourself is an example of a lack of integrity. And he did this when he fought what was known at 2011-12 as the Neem Wars. And he fought, uh, I mean, kicked off the system, people who used fake names. And in the end, it was very much in the interest of these companies that you give many uh, details about who you are. So a few years ago, for instance, Facebook decided to increase uh, the number of identities one can present themselves online. So suddenly it's not just male or female, it's also non-binary and agender and androgynous and many other identities. And no matter what you think about this thing, if you're more conservative or more progressive, just keep in mind this, that even though it looks super progressive, think about the fact that you're still kept in boxes, that you still need to choose an identity for yourself. And when you're choosing an identity, when you put yourself in a box, you help data, you help data being collected for you, and you help what is known as recommendation engines understanding you better, and again, selling you products as a result. But, and there's a big but, the internet is not always like this. Throughout that exact time, there were still game worlds, fantastical worlds that were kept on being developed. It started with this idea of D and D, you know it in Hebrew, Mavuchim v'Drakonim, that still happened and kind of flourished online. Worlds in which we are avatars and we are exercising some sort of fantastic identity, they are keeping, keep happening online. In the early 90s, Neil Stevenson has written a book called Snow Crash. And in this book, he called these worlds in which he guessed, again, in a dystopian view, that we will be connected to in the future and even live and conduct business in, they, he calls them metaverses. He imagines a world where most of our time will be spent in this makeup world where we'll actually work and, and, and deal in business transactions. That idea has manifested itself in worlds like Second Life, about 15, 20 years ago, if you remember that boom. But now having a renaissance in worlds that maybe your students are using, like Roblox. Roblox, through COVID-19, has been the largest social platform for uh, K-12 uh, students. And it's, to, uh, some statistics say that half of American students have used it in some capacity during COVID-19. In this world, you make up things, you make up games, you make up identities. And I want to use another cultural reference because it really shaped where we're probably going or where tech takes us to in terms of identity. And this is the film and book, Ready Player One. I don't know how many of you have seen it, Stover's here. So uh, we have some people who saw it in the audience. The concept it goes like this. The world is going to be a very bleak place with overpopulation and climate change and wars that we will want willingly to spend most of our lives in virtual spaces. We want to escape the physical world because in virtual spaces we can be whoever we want to be. And this book is influenced a very specific guy, the guy in this picture, which is called Lucky Palmer, who invented the new uh, generation of virtual reality glasses called Oculus. And if you want to read more about this guy and his, his quest, The History of the Future is a very recommended book. And this guy has influenced um, Zuckerberg so much, impressed Zuckerberg so much that he bought the company for him, if I remember, at 20, in 2014, when the technology was still being developed. And Zuckerberg was so impressed by their mutual love for the same book, Ready Player One, and he adopted Oculus and the VR vision into the Facebook company, has opened what they call Reality Labs, which where they explore virtual reality, and this guy in the picture here is called Boz, or Andrew Bosworth. He's the CTO of Facebook, one of the most important people at Meta. They're now called, of course, Meta and not Facebook anymore because of the Metaverse idea. 
and they say, listen, we've been talking about one identity for one user for a very long time, but this got to change. We really need to adopt the idea that someone could be more than one thing online, that they could be Batman, but they could also present themselves as Bruce Wayne. And this is very new because for a decade and a half, we were told that we need to be ourselves. This was the deal we made with the internet in some way. We were supposed to gain social capital. They were gaining ad revenue money. So why suddenly Facebook or Meta now is moving to the new model? Well, one can argue that in this new metaverse, they could capture a lot of behaviors that were once in an offline world, like meetings. Mark Zuckerberg is trying to compete, for, for example, with Zoom, making a more immersive space for meetings or classrooms. But this also means that they are going to capture our place in a room. So imagine suddenly that they have access to your classroom and the idea of who sits next to whom. So it's not just what you speak about online that they know, it's also about what are your preferences, what are your body movements, hand gestures, how comfortable are you in a physical virtual space. The idea or the bet here is that we're going to go to a more virtual realm. In that virtual realm, a lot of the things will be machine readable. And by making machine readable things, they will actually encourage you to be all that you want to be. Because when you adopt more than one identity, they have way more information about you. Not just about the real you, but the you you want to be. And what I worry about, that the world we are going to is, a, is, is capturing maybe the long parts of both of the histories of the internet. We could masquerade now in these virtual worlds to be whoever we want to be, but the companies will control us and survey us in a much more personal manner. We can masquerade between ourselves and fake people and, and pretend we are other people to other people in the room, in the classroom, but the company will actually keep an eye on all of this and retain most of the information for themselves. So what I want to leave you with is this question. I, I actually want to leave you with this idea of that we need to get literacy and understanding and seeing the business agenda that is happening around the question of identity. This is not a naive question. This is a world in which we need to understand what companies are doing, what they are doing when we're helping ourselves or students to shape their identity online. And I leave you with that. Thank you very much. Are you scared yet? <laughs> uh, next up, I am delighted to introduce Dr. Rohan Bennett. Uh, he is both a uh, technologist and an academic. He's done a tremendous amount of work on brain research, and he's currently working for a company. Uh, he is CTO at Apollos, which helps goods manufacturers and retailers better manage what's on their store shelves by digitizing kind of images of that. And he's got some really revolutionary ideas. I took the metaphor of the Copernican revolution from some of the work that he's been doing. And in one of his papers, he said, today most of us believe intellectually and intuitively in having a single mental identity throughout our entire lives. And we do. When I asked you to introduce yourself to someone else, you used one thing to share. And that's a consistent sort of identity. But again, what if there are many identities? What if we live in a world where we're creating multiple identities? And what is that going to mean? Dr. Rowe. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. So um, I'm going to start. Uh, I'm going to take it from here from uh, after the great talk by Leo, uh, which actually kind of, um, I don't know how you to say it in English, uh, kind of harimly, you know, like in volleyball that is served. Uh, because, uh, you know, having multiple identities in virtual reality and augmented reality, that's basically the thing that I'm going to explore and I'm going to claim here 
that it's uh, psychologically doable because it's not trivial to say that we can actually perceive ourselves as multiple different kind of personas. Uh, we can speak about this, but th is this actually f psychologically feasible? So I've been exploring in the last 15 years or so, uh, mainly at Microsoft Research, but also in the academia, I've been exploring various kind of options of uh, embodying myself into different kind of uh, avatars, physical or virtual actually, avatars perceiving myself in different forms and seeing how uh, actually uh, psychologically convincing this is. So I'm going to uh, uh, speak here about this kind of old uh, command of Socrates uh, which we adopt today, we say, our, we say to our children, always be yourself, you know, always be authentic. And be, in order to be yourself, in order to empower yourself and find the strengths in yourself, you need to first, you know, know thyself, know yourself, know who you are. But there are some hidden or implicit assumptions behind this saying. The main assumptions are that there is a self, that there is kind of a core kernel, core single identity that I need to explore in order, in order to find and in order to empower. Uh, and all these assumptions, there are kind of five assumptions that I'm going to go through. And uh, within the next uh, 13 minutes or so, I'm, trying to, I'm going to try to invalidate in the world of metaverse. But before we do that, um, uh, I'm going to go over in a few minutes or a few seconds about what is the metaverse, again, continuing the or. So we're talking about augmented reality, uh, virtual reality, and mixed reality. Uh, augmented reality or virtual reality first is having those kind of uh, being implanted in a virtual world that is surrounding you without seeing anything else, uh, which enables this kind of radical embodiment into a completely different form, being in a completely different world. There are many examples of that. Um, augmented reality, as opposed to that, you see the world and you see kind of a 2D overlay on top of the world to the virtual overlay on top of the world. And the extension of it is what we call mixed reality. Sometimes we call this also augmented reality today, which is using glasses that are transparent. You see the world, but then you see holograms on top of this world. I've been working at Microsoft mainly on this product, on the Microsoft HoloLens, the incubation of this product. This is, okay. This is a video uh, from the first days. That's kind of the introductory video of the first generation of the Microsoft HoloLens. Uh, which actually shows real kind of captures of how it looks like to have these kind of holograms and this kind of virtual world around you while seeing the real world. We'll focus uh, on this talk mainly on, in virtual reality where you are kind of surrounded completely with another world and then you can be transplanted into a different body and what it makes to our psychology. So the first assumption that I'm going to explore is um, a very uh, powerful assumption that we strongly believe in, that the perception of our body is inborn and fixed, that we have this kind of, we call this uh, homon homunculus in the brain that kind of represents the shape of our body, that we have hands, legs, etc., etc., and that it has certain proportions. And now we know, and I'm got, not going to get into all the details of, those, of this research, you can kind of believe me or ask me afterwards, but now we know, following a uh, uh, studies that show that, that if we synchronize sorry, being stroked at it? the same time as the it's real hand. hand. Anyway, I'll skip that because it has volume. But when you're synchronizing touch and vision, then you get to believe that what you're seeing is actually part of your body. I've been exploring this also in Microsoft uh, by developing kind of tactile gloves that you kind of bounce. That's from 2009. You see me here kind of. Uh, bouncing a kind of a, a balloon, a virtual balloon uh, with Xbox, with code running on Xbox and getting tactile feedback and, and it made you feel as if you're actually getting the sense of touch from the display and later from the virtual reality. And then came multiple studies that showed that if we embody ourselves in different forms, different uh, uh, forms of uh, um, animals, for instance, in virtual reality, then you completely and immediately believe that you have this kind of body shape uh, in virtual reality. When I showed this to my uh, child yesterday, my younger child, Bar, eight years old, he said like, okay, so like, da, obviously. He used, uh, he's using virtual reality quite uh, intensively and for him, uh, the idea that once you are inside a body of a spider, you actually feel as if you have those kind of long legs, that's trivial. So 
we needed this research originally, but now it's quite trivial that in virtual reality you can get into any body form and your brain immediately believes. So that's the first assumption. The first assumption, we invalidate that. And in the metaverse, we actually say that our perceived physical identity is learned. It's something that we learned. And in the metaverse, you can completely transform to anything. And the brain believes within minutes that you are this kind of new physical identity. That's about the physical identity. Okay, and what about perceiving the world differently, not only our body? Do we all perceive the world exactly the same? That's kind of a very basic assumption. Okay. And only our interpretation or our cognitive interpretation of it perhaps differs between us. So now we know that we actually can choose sometimes how to perceive the world, such as in this classic uh, uh, Necker's Cube uh, example. You can see it either like this or like that. You can try it right now. But you can't see both, or you can't see, uh, you can't be in between those two states. Okay, try this for a moment. And there are other examples where just by a uh, changing perspective, we see uh, these kind of uh, plates as convex instead of concave and vice versa, just because we have some in inborn or implicit assumptions about, about the direction of the light of the sun coming on these objects. And another kind of classic example is this dress that I see as gold and white. Okay, most of, or some of you see it like me, and some see it as blue and black. Just a, a quick example, a quick experiment. How many of you see it like me as in the colors of white and gold? Raise your hand. Okay, look around you. How many of you see it as blue and black? Okay, so it's kind of 50 50. Okay, it, this relies on hidden assumptions that we have about the direction of light in the world. So we don't actually perceive the world similarly, okay? We see the world uh, based on assumptions, hidden assumptions that we have. Also, uh, this affects also how we perceive the world. And in the metaverse, this is quite arbitrary, okay? And arbitrary in terms of being controlled by AI that will generate the metaverse for us, okay? The next assumption, assumption number three, my identity has a core unchangeable inner root, kind of a soul or a spirit, kind of a mental self. This is me, okay? You told each other, who are you? This is me, I'm Rotem. That's how I was born. Perhaps I can change a bit, but I have this kind of a root inside of me. Now we know that this is also incorrect, okay? In experiments that show how we can modify memories of people just by letting them tell about themselves some kind of stories that they have to, made up, to make up uh, uh, when they see fake images of themselves from the past. They have to make up the stories and they gradually kind of start to being convinced that this is their story, okay? And, and who we are is the narrative, the story that we tell about ourselves. It highly relies on the memories that we have and the memory that we maintain. And in the metaverse, be it in virtual reality or, or augmented reality, you eventually experience a, a various things happening around you. You can re-experience memories as 3D kind of replay such as in this example of Shara Mizadi, uh, who worked with me at uh, Microsoft, uh, where you can replay memories, but these memories can be modified. These memories can be manipulated. These memories can be, you know, you will probably add filters in order to kind of make those memories uh, much nicer for you, okay? Kind of Instagram filters only in the metaverse. So what will be eventually your identity or your true, true memory? Will it be what happened really? Will it be your actual kind of real identity, or will it be what eventually you decided to uh, apply a filter, and, a filter on and use? Uh, same goes with multiple identities. We know from the pathological cases, from uh, dissociative identity disorders, that we have this kind of inter-identity amnesia, that when I'm in one character, I kind of forget or I have less access to memories of, the other, of myself in the other characters. And gamers know this quite well. When you're playing multiple identities and you switch between those identities, if I ask you, what did you do yesterday? You will uh, first think about what you did in this character yesterday. And definitely so when you're in the metaverse, in virtual reality, completely and immersively em embodied in a certain character. So this basic assumption is also invalidated in the metaverse. So, and in the metaverse, the self-identity is a memory-based narrative. That's always true. Uh, and reality is what induces the illusion of a stable core self. That's just an illusion. And in the metaverse, 
uh, the experiences create multiple identities for us. Again, either you know, we create it or AI will create it for us. The one, the one before last uh, assumption is that my cognition is not related to my physical uh, appearance. I, we say, you know, uh, this is my physical appearance. It has nothing to do with myself, with my identity, with my capacities, with my cognitive capacities, which, is, which are also a core or important part of how I perceive myself, who I am. Okay, and that's also something that I, uh, in particular, studied uh, at the Technion. Uh, part of my PhD was to explore uh, how, when we're changing the body proportions of people in the metaverse, in virtual reality, it actually affects the cognitive capacities. Because when I'm closer, for instance, when I'm closer to those cognitive stimuli in those cognitive tests, I perform completely different than when I'm farther away. And in an another example, in a research I did where I made people uh, believe that virtual hands are their hands, but the virtual hands moved slightly different from what they expected in virtual reality. Okay, so the, the hands moved either in the same speed of the real hands or much faster. They didn't kind of notice that, but that change made them kind of, made their brain uh, need to adapt to this new world. And eventually the result was that they became kind of a virtual uh, baby, okay, virtual newborns in the sense that we saw that brain areas that are active in terms of kind of critical, critical periods of, uh, of acquiring cognitive, you know, uh, primitives, you know, Piaget, et cetera, all this kind of came back to life when they were in virtual reality and had to adapt to this new body. So this assumption as well is invalidated and our cognition is actually heavily and, and is significantly coupled with our physical appearance. So cognition is fundamentally embodied. That's how we call it. A fixed body led to a universally similar cognition. Okay, so we all have kind of the same uh, uh, definition of what cognition is how we think about things, but that's because we all have the same form of body or physical body, human physical body. And cognition can be relearned or reacquired and modified in the metaverse. The last assumption is that AI will never be indistinguish indistinguishable from humans. So now the metaverse will be created automatically, etc. eventually. Will be created uh, it's in terms of the avatars and the world surrounding us. So will this be convincing enough to actually make us believe that we have a different, a completely different identity just because the AI uh, decided so? So first of all, a few, something like 30 seconds intro about what are artificial neural networks. It's basically a, a, a way to uh, computerize the way neurons are working in the brain. And eventually we're training a model to, for instance, recognize faces. So we, enter, so we insert inputs on the left side uh, of the model uh, and there are weights and kind of connections and strengths that eventually lead to a certain output. The output is the name of the person, for instance, George. If this is true in this particular example, then we go back along the network and we strengthen, we uh, make stronger all the connections that led to this true result. If this is a mistake, then we go back, we find the blame, we find all those connections that actually led to this mistake and we make them weaker and so on and so forth. We go through uh, millions of examples and, and repetitions and eventually the network learns how to identify the names of these persons or if a person is real or fake, for instance. We can train a model for that as well. And eventually we see that in the internal, the kind of hidden layers of the network, we see the same uh, phenomena that we see in the brain as well in terms of what is encoded in each layer. Uh, how many of you know this well famous girl uh, that came, uh, that, how many of you saw her any, any time? Okay, so she became famous uh, for a moment. She had her one moment when she appeared on my uh, browser one time, but she uh, actually isn't real. Uh, if you now take your phone and just uh, open Chrome or whatever the Explorer and type this person doesn't exist.com, okay, and I, I definitely invite you to do so, this person does not exist.com and refresh the page, you will get a, an image of some person that is completely, uh, that completely does not exist. Okay, this girl does not exist. And whenever you refresh the page, you get another image or another kind of 3D model, it can be, of a person that does not exist. And how does that work? Uh, so we have GANs, generative 
you are networks that are gener generating, they are not identifying persons, they are generating contents. And these new models that are kind of boomed in the last few years are now mature to generate the new metaverse, to generate identities and 3D models and fake, fake identities and fake avatars that you will never know that they are actually bots that are walk, uh, walking around you and that are uh, speaking with you. And the same goes for language. New language models are indistinguishable from humans. Okay, you, will, you can read whole texts, whole articles that were written by GPT-3 or other language models and that you will never know that it wasn't written by anyone human. And it goes on and on. And now we have uh, also examples that are already using those uh, it's called date stable diffusion models. This is a, an example by uh, Scotty, uh, I think, uh, um, uh, which generated, which led, or which let AI model generate a virtual reality uh, world around him uh, and keep changing this kind of a dreamlike experience. So this assumption is also invalidated, which leads me to the end of this talk. So AI will soon pass the basic Turing test. Metaverse will be AI generated and personalized and identity in the metaverse will be affected, affected by AI. So we tell our children to always be yourself, uh, but there is this famous meme, always be yourself unless you can be Batman, okay? And then be Batman. But the next point or, and, and I'm definitely stealing some time here, so sorry. The next point is, do we want everyone to be Batman? Okay, what if, Everyone around me, around me would be Batman, but I would be kind of a less nice Batman. Do I really want to see in my feed all those Batmans with their happy families and their happy moments and everything is happy and only me, not, not precisely like that. So the main overlooked problem, and that's perhaps the, the most important point in this talk for me, is that because it's overlooked by all the experts, is that we are not training the models in the right direction. We're training those models to identify that something is realistic or not. Okay, it's all those guns, those generative models, they train to be as realistic as possible, but we need to train them to make our well-being as, posi as positive as possible. And that's a tough question because we don't know how to define this. So this is the key challenge for all those thinkers and all of you, okay, education experts, philosophers, psychologists, to define what is actually the thing that we want to see in those social networks and in the metaverse around us that will make our well-being much better. It's not about being realistic or immersive or amazing. We want some kind of combination that would enable the AI experts to eventually train the models properly in the right direction. And the right direction is not about realism, it's about making us uh, uh, happier. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, in, over the course of my career, I've had an opportunity to interview many, many researchers and entrepreneurs. And one of the best definitions I ever heard of an entrepreneur was when I talked to one guy and he said to me, I get a lot of traffic tickets for running through red lights. And I said, okay, this is clearly a known problem. Why do you get so many traffic tickets? And he said, because when I'm in my car, I'm looking at the light that's two blocks down the street, and I forget about the light right in front of me. And I think this is actually an interesting summary of the challenge that educators confront every day. Educators are teaching the kids who are in your classroom today. You are at that first light. And sometimes the, the research, the ideas that we're talking about are two lights away. And so how do we make sure that we don't have inner, uh, traffic accidents at the first light? This brings me to our third guest. Uh, Shir Schwartz is a head of learning and, uh, design, experience, and exper design experience at the Center for Educational Technology here in Tel Aviv, and she leads the creative unit at CET to promote innovative and relevant learning experiences in all of the products that they're building. And over the last 15 years, she's led many, many learning projects for the educational sector. She's even been a special ed teacher. So she is grounded in the here and now, which is great. 
So bring us to the present, Cher. Let's talk a little bit about some of the products that are being designed today. We've heard all of these amazing ideas about, you know, uh, identity. Who are we, you know, how are we really incorporating this idea of identities into, um, into the products that you're building right now? So first of all, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for all of be, for being here because we are very ex exciting for that uh, at CET. Um, I think I'll start uh, by saying um, that the idea of uh, identities is not new at all. Yes, we know it for years, um, but everything is changing now with the digital um, age that we are into, if you didn't notice. Um, and maybe the basic idea that I want all of us to, to take from here, to understand um, that educators have to acknowledge those identities and to understand that students go into the classroom every day with their identities from outside and inside the classroom. And we need first to recognize it and understand and know which identity uh, everybody brings to their class. Uh, we need to um, embrace it and um, maybe do some things that we can uh, have them uh, more engaged because it relates to their identity. And of course, every, each teacher comes with her own hair or his. Uh, identity, identities, as uh, you guys uh, said about uh, multiple identities. Um, so I think that's the first point. We have to um, embrace it, we have to recognize, we uh, have to respect those identities. And about uh, this uh, changing of uh, the digital age, so I think we, we must understand that those kids are, uh, are out there on, the, on social media and uh, they shape their identities. I think this is something that we're not quite yet get, because think, of, for example, about childhood. Um, 25 years ago, something like that, childhood was a hidden thing, a mystery. We didn't have each moment documented uh, like uh, our children do these days. Yes, they just um, take pictures all day long and upload it. I think uh, Meta called stories, um, uh, their stories for a reason, stories, because we tell stories. And by telling those stories on social media, we actually create our identity or identities. And um, that's the thing that we, that we need to understand. Something else is happening. We are constantly building those identities and changing. And um, maybe the, the most thing that um, I suggest you guys, my fellow educators to do is to be there, to understand what exactly they do on those social platforms, how they connect, how they, they talk, because it's, it's a language. It's, and maybe it's even different languages on each platform, because you, you have your identity on LinkedIn, for example, which I suppose is going to be some more professional identity. Um, I can say for myself that on LinkedIn, I post some more uh, professional and serious things. Uh, but on TikTok, for example, we will be maybe a little bit uh, ridiculous, maybe um, embarrassing ourselves for, uh, for a moment because that's the platform, that's the medium, and it urges you to, to, to act this way. So we have to understand where those children play, yes, wh wh what they do all day long. And I think we have to embrace those things in school uh, at CET, we try to do that um, during our uh, uh, develop, development um, in a way of let them choose uh, content by their interests, for example, or um, go in pr uh, progress on their own phase, um, depending or, or, uh, on, um, on the way that they feel uh, or know. Uh, another thing that I just remembered that I really wanted to say about um, embracing the, those uh, identities in class, that research shows uh, it empowers academic 
um, uh, ability and even well-being ability. And of course, after COVID-19, all of us are talking about uh, this well-being and cell. So um, that's another uh, issue that uh, we should address too. Uh, Thank you. I Thank you so go, much. <laughs> no, we, 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 well, first off, I will uh, re-invite you to participate in the conversation through Slido. If you uh, want to either upvote a question or put in a question, feel free to. I think we have a few minutes to uh, to do this. Um, but we've so we've raised two really interesting questions, right? One is we've said we want to be student-centered and student-led, and we want the students to, you know, understand what they're interested in and, and capitalize on that. And then at the same time, we've said that we're creating identity. I would love to have each of you just take a moment to talk about how do we do both of those things at the same time? How can we ask students to tell us what they're interested in if they're in the process of building identity? And is, you know, what is the role for the educator, the community, in shaping these, these identities and these interests? So I, I wanna comment based on my experience also in the classroom and say the following. I think technology affords us to take both of the important values here. On one hand, making students, and also ourselves, by the way, because we also deal with all these identities. I know that a lot of you have fake identities online because you don't want the students to see. That's very common with teachers. So we all feel it, and we know that the technology can afford us both, A, be accountable for our actions, representing ourselves in the best manner, but also allow a space for exploration. I can share with you that recently, I'm actually very Zoom-oriented. I love teaching through Zoom, and I'll explain you why. Just because, it in a yeah, box. just in a box, yeah. <laughs> I did a lot of hand gestures. <laughs> um, because it allows new ideas of participation, like the idea that introvert students could write me in person without having to face the entire classroom. The idea that I could use software and get anonymous answers for my question. I recently taught uh, in Hong Kong, mainland China students. In there, nobody wants to get it wrong. Nobody wants to be humiliated in front of the class. I'm talking about master students, not, not uh, kids here. Still, they are so fearful of getting it wrong. And the internet allowed me to get their answers anonymously. They engaged more and they've been more authentic in a way. And they were just being more receptive. So our choice of tools, it's our responsibility to choose the right tools so they can do both. Both having exploration and accountability. Excellent. Well, I think there is a huge challenge, uh, especially in understanding uh, the world of children in terms of their identities in those, all those platforms because, um, you know, I, I admire Shia for using TikTok. I don't use TikTok. I, I, w I don't want to embarrass my four kids. And, <laughs> but there is a huge gap between me and them because their time with the screens narrows down to how much time they spend with the screens. But they actually have a whole world in TikTok and Instagram, etc. Not, they don't have Twitter. I have Twitter. But that's a different world. And the main challenge is to, we must experience this world and it's complicated perhaps we need com some kind of an adult version of tiktok some something separate but <laughs> something, something slower that will yes yeah, slower that will make us understand the rules of this world and what kind of separate identities we may have there and what kind of identities our children have there because otherwise uh, we have no chance in actually understanding them and then going forward to to help them uh, uh, you know establish those identities in the best way possible. Let's see. Let's take some questions from the audience. Absolutely. Where's the question? Question? Just a minute. Okay. Um, Shear mentioned play, but Lior and Roran tells the story of the death of play. Okay. Let's, let's first take a poll. Do you guys agree? Do you think you talked about the death of play? Well, the, the, the opposite is correct. You know, it's, uh, it's actually the, the, you know, playing, uh, mainly playing uh, your life uh, in those environments. Okay, so there's a, it's a different type of play. 
Yeah, definitely. I think even think about your students or your uh, uh, pupils, they play in the school, even though it's a very controlled environment. So this too can co-occur, play and surveillance and just maybe a different type of play. And to the point that Rota made is that, you know, as adults, we need to experience these worlds too. Sometimes it, it can seem dangerous. It can be more playful when it feels less dangerous. So maybe the more experiences we have, the less dangerous it feels. Uh, let's see, we have two votes. Does the reality described here suggest a new kind of essential literacy, a need to understand how corporations are identifying or manipulating our identity? Everybody want to say yes, 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 a hundred percent. In the United States, we have some groups that are very focused on digital literacy and it literally, they literally will take school children through examples such as the photos that we saw and said, how can you tell the difference? And there are some telltale signs sometimes where you can almost tell the differences, but 100%, the need for digital literacy. Anybody wanna add into that? It's pretty clear, yes. The answer is we're not doing enough to teach both ourselves and later also on students on how to deal with this new reality, how to deal with fake news, how to deal with fake identities, how to talk about identity offline and online uh, in a way that will protect them, but through knowledge, which I think is the, that's education really. I can add that this is our responsibility as parents, as educators, um, and uh, that's why I said before that we have to be there. We have to understand, even though we don't have a TikTok channel, or that's okay, but we need to understand the language. We need to figure out how to engage them, how to be there for them, and how to help them um, and uh, prevent, you know, some uh, risks. So. Well, I think the, the, the key thing that we need to, t to teach them is to adjust to changes because the, by the time that we will get to teach them about this particular reality or the next reality, by, the t by this time, there will be other realities. So they need to adjust to changes, to changes in changes because the pace is just becoming faster and faster. Absolutely. Okay, uh, let's see. And uh, many dangerous and scares about the ones controlling our identity to make kids aware of this. Is that making the insecure? Do the, so in other words, um, how much, I think this is a classic question. How much do we create fear by sharing these ideas versus how much do we empower people? Thoughts? I think our kids are not, you know, they're not scared that easily of technology. I think for you, it might be like a different generation. It could be, it sounds more scary than it is, I think. They have, talking about literacy, they have a lot of literacy on these, uh, f about these digital worlds. I don't think they're scared, but I do think maybe they're not always asking the right questions in a sense. And I do think a conversation, like we have very serious conversation about, I don't know, climate change in class or other very disturbing topics. This is just one more thing we have to understand and sort of uh, I would say understand together, because as Autumn said, this is currently constantly changing. So we are in the process of understanding it all, in, all the time. I think something uh, very important is that they will understand that truth doesn't exist anymore in terms of uh, the ability, the easy ability to fake everything. That's something crucial that children must know that even if they see a video, a very convincing video of something, it's not necessarily true. Uh, the uh, American voting population could do with some help with that, for sure. Um, okay, I have one or two last quick questions, and then we'll sum it up. First, how many fake identities do each of you have? I'll confess I have three. I don't want to say. <laughs> You're not saying, okay. Actually, I don't have a fake identity, but in Microsoft, everyone knew only my avatar. It, that was my, kind of my identity. So people meeting me uh, couldn't recognize me until they saw my avatar. I'd and even back. my kids, when they're playing in Xbox, when they see my avatar, they say, oh, here's father. That's, that's But you me. only have one avatar. But I, but only, I only have one, yeah. Okay. I used to have a lot, but I have to admit, I neglected almost all of them because it just takes a lot of time to sustain all these different identities. It so, takes a lot of time. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, so just to sum up, what I've learned from this panel is that number one, there is a new literacy that we need to be talking about, and it is this digital world. And this digital world may have a lot of, um, of, of splintered identities in it, of other people, even of ourself. We may need to learn this with our kids in gener in, together. And that may be the only way of staying current on this. And so uh, perhaps kind of having these conversations with our students, with our children, and jointly learning about this world together. Um, and then the third thing that I would add is clearly technology unlocks many capabilities. It is profoundly the role of the educator to say, what are our values? What are the things that we truly value? What are the things that we want to uh, see done in technology? And so I personally would just continually encourage educators to use your voice. Please join me in thanking this fabulous panel. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you, Betsy. Thank you, all the participants.